Thanks for, for the invitation and thanks for being here. My name is Alvaro, as he said, and uh, the talk is called Lector in Código. Uh, for those of you that know some Latin, this is completely wrong because it's uh, Lector in Fabula. That's a book by Umberto Eco, which um, is similar to when in English you say, speak of the devil. So lupus in fabula in Italian means like when the wolf is about to appear because it was just called, like when you say, uh, speak of the devil. And in código, that's the word for code in Spanish. Because, um, yeah, it's just um, an inside joke about all these uh, languages that are mixed when you go across the former Roman Empire, let's say. Anyway. I work at fauna.com, where we make this uh, FaunaDB database. It's a NoSQL acid uh, database. Um, you can ask me more if you want later. Uh, I also collaborated with the last season of HBO Silicon Valley. Before, uh, I used to work at Apple um, and the Applied Machine Learning team. Before that, I used to be a RabbitMQ core developer. I also work. Um, as a lead engineer for one of Germany's biggest dating websites, which I will not name. Uh, some of you may know what the name is. Um, yeah, I live right now in Switzerland. I used to live in China. I'm from Uruguay. So yeah, whatever. The idea of the talk is to explore the relation between the process of writing computer programs and writing works of fiction, most importantly, based on some ideas from Umberto Eco, from that book I mentioned already called Lector in Fabula, and another one called Six Walks in the Fictional Woods. This book is um, Norton Lectures, gave by Umberto Eco. For those of you that, li that like literature or literary theory, the Norton Lectures is like a very good um, writer. is invited to, I think, Harvard, and they give these lectures. Uh, Borges was there and many other famous writers. And why do I bring this here? And thanks for the conference to trust in this talk. Is because writers, they have been studying through many years how to communicate ideas better, how to make sure that this story I'm trying to build, I transmit it to you without you being there when I'm reading, like I'm reading a book from Umberto Eco or, some, or somebody. And Umberto Eco won't be there explaining the book to me, but I, I should be able to understand and know what they try to say. Uh, as programmers, we are also communicating ideas all the time, but we are really fixated on how to make really good algorithms, which is, uh, is very important. But most of the time, we are talking to clients, uh, collecting requirements, and so on, and translating those requirements into code. So. How do we do this knowledge transfer between programmers and, and clients and inside the team, the future me that has no idea what I'm doing right now? Um, how do we do all this trans transfer of knowledge? So there is a star there because I have no idea what better could mean, but for some definition of better. And I want to start with this paper that is uh, from the 60s. Author, author unknown, because uh, this paper was rescued from Donald Knuth's uh, archives. Uh, not even Knuth knows who wrote that paper. So good luck finding that out. And I think it's one of the best unknown papers in, in the industry, because it really tells many things that actually uh, we face today in day-to-day -day programming. And this person says that a programmer does not primarily write code, rather, he primarily writes to another programmer about his problem solution. So this person is saying that to program is to communicate how I solve a problem, in this case, using a computer program. Um, from there, we go to the um, uh, structure and interpretation of computer programs. You probably know that book um, was used at, at MIT for teaching uh, programming. And they say, um, Programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. Again, putting as a, as a first uh, pillar, let's say, communication between 
people and not computers. Computers, they happen to be the current tool that is really fast at executing algorithms. It might not be the ultimate tool. This is something we sometimes lose track of when, when we are so focused on computers and architectures and so on. And also, who here, maybe if you are doing something really high performance, who here is really worrying about the architecture, underlying architecture of your computer? Probably nobody. Maybe you're even running on Amazon, or I don't know where. Um, so, but we forget that actually we need to write code that is, can be easily shared between parameters. And if we go to a paper back in 1955, I think, uh, David Wheeler, he invented the subroutine, because that's what poor people do in England back in the 50s. This guy said, let's create subroutines. And in this paper, the, the finishing remarks, uh, he says, the above remarks might be summarized by saying subroutines are very useful, although not absolutely necessary, and that the prime objectives to be borne in mind when constructing them are simplicity of use, uh, correctness of cause, and accuracy of description. All compl complexities should, if possible, be buried out of sight. So, yeah, they are writing in a kind of assembler in those, uh, in those examples, and you don't need subroutines. You can just write your whole thing in assembler if you want. You want to be a real programmer, like uh, von Neumann used to say? He said writing binary code. For him, assembler was like a waste of time. So uh, the problem or the idea behind subroutines is also to make programs easier to, re to read, to debug, simplicity of use, abstraction, and so on. Which brings me to literature and programming, and particularly this uh, paper by Donald Knuth called Liter Literary Programming. You probably have heard of this one. And Knuth says, instead of imagining that our main task is to instruct a computer what to do, let us concentrate rather on explaining to human beings what we want a computer to do. Again, center stage for humans. So in this paper, Knuth introduces the web system, like a system, I don't know if you know about literary programming, but basically you, the top level thing is your comments, and then you introduce a marker saying this is code that has to be executed. So you are telling a story, and then the actual code that does whatever is there, then you continue with kind of documentation, which in a way today is kind of what we have in Javadocs or any kind of tool similar to Javadocs. So this paper, explain how this web system works, but they don't explain um, how to write code that's easier to understand. And also Newt says it will be a time when people will read computer programs as, as work of literature. I completely disagree with that. There is a book by uh, Espen Erset, he's from the Denmark, and it's, oh, Denmark, it's just oh, one. The Netherlands, only one Denmark. Um, anyway, cybertext. Perspective on Ergodic Literature. This book tries to anal analyze how there are many new kinds of literature that appear in, uh, since in the last 50 years. And uh, it's a literature that expects some kind of effort from the reader. That's what the word ergodic means in this context. Like computer programs could be one of this kind of, uh, of literature. Uh, games like adventure games will be another kind. Um, games like the Chinese uh, I Ching is another one, and so on. And this author says that a search for literary value in texts that are neither intended nor structured as literature will only obscure the unique aspect of these texts and transform a formal investigation into an apologetic crusade. Because, yeah, we don't write programs to write pieces of literature unless you're doing some kind of art. And that is not what I care about in this talk. I care about how we as programmers working in a team manage to share knowledge between ourselves that this program needs to fulfill a very human specific task. Maybe sort user from a database, uh, parse a web form, uh, implement a, a, an index for a, for a database like a fauna, I don't know. That's what I care. I don't care if you are going to stare at the code and be marvel and have some kind of ecstasy. No, I, I mean, cool story, bro, but not what I care. Um, and this person also says that programs are normally written with two kinds of receivers in mind, the, the machines and other programmers. This gives rise to a double standard of aesthetics, often in conflict, efficiency, and clarity. 
And another researcher, I think she's, or they are from the Netherlands, this time in plural, uh, they say like, yeah, you have this, uh, this uh, conflict between efficiency and clarity, which if you have been to, I think in past years there have been talks about performance, that modern compilers are better at, at optimizing code if this, if this code is well factored. So the, the thing that I need to write really smart code to be fast is kind of a myth these days, depending on where you are for sure. But anyway, they say like, a difference between writing and programming is that in programming, the programmer gets feedback very early on whether the program text is executable during compiling. Furthermore, they get feedback on whether the program is working as intended. So a big discussion when, whenever I, we talk about literature or metaphors or whatever these things in programming is like, yeah, that's really cool, but when you have a program, the program, the computer or the compiler or somebody will tell you if it's wrong or not. When you have a text, or you know grammar, or you have no idea, and you have no idea to know if the other person will understand and what not. This is a fair criticism, but I also don't think it's um, complete. Because you can have early feedback, but you have no idea what the program actually means, and that's what we care when we share knowledge. What the program does is just one piece of information. What process from the real world is this program trying to represent? How was the problem solved? Um, we can compare this with uh, music interpretation. For those of you that don't, don't play the guitar, this is, um, imagine this is the neck of the guitar, this is the sixth string, this is the first string, so from top to bottom, like it's always cool to reverse things when you do a graph so people don't understand. But anyway, you have the notes, these are all the frets when you put the finger, so you have E, F, G, all the notes, and here you have the octave. But a thing that happens in the guitar is that this E here is the same as this one, and it's the same as this one. That's how you tune a guitar. People touch here, A, and to touch th this one, so if these two sound the same, this string is in tune with this one. But point is, you can have many E inter uh, sounds being the same and different positions. And there is a, uh, Abel Carlevaro, he's um, or was a musical teacher from Uruguay. He created a new method of how to learn guitar. And, and he has that kind of notation that I will mention soon. And he says, correct guitar playing is inconceivable without correct fingering. And he says, like, here you, you should have uh, no finger first finger, second finger, fourth finger, and so on. Because in correct guitar playing, correct guitar interpretation, it matters where you have the fingers from which of these three places you actually made the E sound uh, come out. So bringing this to programming is not just about the result having the E sound, it's about what actually the algorithm is doing behind the scenes. Like Knut also says in the art of computer programming, is two a random number? Why not? If I have a hard coder return two in, inside a random function, fight me. Uh, it's, it's a square function that returns a hard coded 25, a correct implementation. As long as we provide five by minus five as argument, this is correct. So TDD actually advocates doing this kind of programming. You hard code 25 and then you have your first implementation of square. So as the... Um, Mr. Sarcasm, a.k.a. Dijkstra, used to say, program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. Back to testing or early feedback, uh, besides from using something like Quick Check or Scala Check or whatever translation of that tool you have in your language, it's really hard to actually know that a program is correct. And even if you have early feedback, maybe somebody hard coded 25 inside. Or maybe somebody said, uh, wrote a for loop to do plus n, plus n, plus n, n times. And that will work as well. And you can change it, or you can use a monoid if you want, and have multiplication of, of integers, matrices, and whatever. So what is this program actually doing, right? So back to the original question, how can we share knowledge between programmers? 
you probably have been in this team. I have been in this team. There are somebody, the, the 10 times engineer, 10 x engineer, is telling you that the code speaks for itself. But something we need to understand when we read code is that we are not adversaries. Why do we have this mentality that you should be able to run deep dive into the code and be able to reverse engineer it or whatever? We are not adversaries. This is not a hacking competition. This is like a team working together. So like, imagine every time we try to read a book, we have to play code breakers. Unless you're reading Finnegan's Wake from, from Joyce, then you don't want to be doing code breaking, right? So there is another paper, this time by Peter Now, the guy from, thanks to Now, Danish people do not trust them with your computers. He came with the idea of Algol. Another Danish person came with the idea of C++. Another one came with the idea of PHP. And another one with the idea of Ruby on Rails. So <laughs> will you let Danish people touch a computer? I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway. Programming a theory building. <laughs> let's, go, let's focus here. Uh, and now says that um, when we program, we should build a theory of the problem we are trying to solve. And this person that has a theory, in that sense, knows how to do certain things, and in addition, can support the actual doing with explanation, justifications, and answer to queries about the activity of concern. Let's say I work at RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ doesn't support some flags from the MQP protocol. We know, as, uh, or use, like, is documented somewhere why that flag is not possible. Because when you need to replicate data across a system, distributed system, and all the problems you have with consensus, it's really expensive to do that particular flag from the NQP protocol. So as RabbitMQ developers, we have the theory to know, yeah, this flag is really nice, cool idea, but we cannot have it. Otherwise, this will be super slow. So this, the, with this idea, the programmer knows what's, what has to be built, but the programmer is a theory of how certain affairs of the world will be handled by or supported by a computer program. But a problem, he says, like, it's really nice to have this theory, but this theory is very hard to share. It won't be reflected in documentation or in the program text. So how many times somebody has left your team and you have no idea how whatever this person uh, was doing? Where is this knowledge? It's lost. And uh, now puts many examples of teams arriving into a company, then the, old, the original team leaves, and then the others, they kind of need to re-implement the system to rebuild the, the theory, because the theory is gone. So nobody knows why in, tal in, in that part of the program they are calling not the standard C++ function, they are calling something else, or somebody decided to rewrite left path. I don't know. Because maybe sometime in the history of the internet, somebody removed left path from node, uh, from NPM, so we better have it locally, right? So maybe this is doc not documented anywhere, but you arrive into the, into, the, into the project and you say, there is NPM left path. Why did you re-implement the wheel? OK, because sometimes that happened, but this is nowhere. So how can we share this theory? Umberto Eco has the idea of the encyclopedia. What is the encyclopedia? There are two encyclopedias. One is the, in uppercase, what is the, all the world's knowledge, let's say. And the lowercase one is the knowledge that we have, each one as individuals, or experiences, whatever we read, whatever we, le we learn somewhere, etc. So all the world knowledge versus my knowledge. So what Echo says is that as an um, author, you appeal to the encyclopedia of another person so you don't have to write everything in your book. If I say I took a carriage to go back to Alexander Platz, you probably assume that it was a horse pulling that carriage. Why? Because the author assumed that we will fill in details on this fictional world with the details from the, from the real world. Basically, the, um, if, if you want to be Marxist, like Umberto Eco says, the, a, a text uh, lives on the surplus value or work made by the reader, because the reader is the one adding all this extra value into uh, a text. And also, he, goes, he discusses the idea of, of, of information th theory by Claude Shannon, because this uh, diagram by Shannon is really cool, but Never there, is, we talk about the competence of the destinatary or the receiver of the message. Of the message. Uh, if I now switch to my mother language and start to speak in Spanish, many of you probably will not understand me, even though 
I encode the message in some channel, it reaches your ears, and then when you try to decode it, it's just lost there. So that's one way, but even if I'm speaking in English, um, I assume everybody understands English here, some things I might be saying, maybe you don't know, and then maybe you ask me a question that I have no idea what you're talking about, and in a book, this happens uh, all the time. So the author, needs to know or assume how much of this encyclopedia the receiver has or doesn't have. Imagine trying to read a book from um, back in the 30s, or I don't know, anybody here read Borges? Jorge Luis Borges, Argentinian author, yeah, cool. The whole room for the, for the camera track for people in YouTube later. Uh, so Borges, in a story called Funes el Memorioso, Funes el Memorios, He's talking about a guy from uh, Uruguay, and he uses a word called oriental, which oriental is the way the Uruguayans, is the way the Argentinians call the Uruguayans. So historically, it has a whole other connotation than just saying Uruguayans, and this thing is translated in English. So there's a lot of encyclopedia that is lost if you read, for example, just Borges uh, in... Even if you are a Spanish person living today, there are a lot of things that you probably have no idea. When he talks about mate, he's not talking about club mate. Funes has an actual mate there, uh, and so on. Anyway, absent some details, we fill in details from our own encyclopedia. How do we manage that? How do we know the encyclopedia we need to have or don't? Echo introduces the idea of the model reader, and the model reader is not the empirical reader, it's a reader that lives on the mind of the author, the empirical one, let's say Umberto Eco or Borges. And this reader is built as the author writes the story. And this reader helps the author decide how much detail to include in the story. So do I need to explain that the carriages are pulled by horses or not? Or, or this is assumed? Depends on, on, on the context. For example, until I went to China and I saw the actual Chinese, big Chinese wall, I had no idea how it was. And maybe somebody from back in the east-west part in, in Germany, having their encyclopedia of what a wall is to keep people in one side or the other, maybe they imagined that the Chinese wall was something like that. I don't know. It could happen. Or a Chinese person maybe think that the Berlin Wall was like this huge thing they had there in China. It could happen. Uh, so, how important is interpretation? How important is having a model reader? Let's look at this example from literary theory. You see this sign in, let's say, the London Underground, and it says, dogs must be carried on the escalator. Does it mean that you must carry a dog in the escalator? <laughs> Are you going to be banned from the escalator unless you find a stray dog to carry? <laughs> Carried is to be taken metaphorically and help dogs get through life. <laughs> How do I know this is not a decoration? If I see this sign here, it's clearly that somebody stole it from the urban and put it there, right? I don't know. I need to understand that the sign has been placed there by some authority. Conventions. I understand that escalator means this escalator and not some escalator in Paraguay. And must be means must be now. So there is a lot of things that we do as humans to actually understand as a text that is as simple as that. But we know, like he has a t-shirt saying obey. I'm not going to obey, like, <laughs> right? It's, it's, a, it's a really nice t-shirt, like this one, I don't know, whatever it is. Uh, I will, yes. <laughs> Let me put my glasses. <laughs> uh, because. Again, uh, Echo says there is a lot of textual co uh, cooperation between that model reader and the, um, and the author. As I said earlier, a text is a lazy or economic mechanism that lives on the surplus value of meaning introduced by the recipient. And Echo also says a text wants someone to help it work. And reading is essentially a work of cooperation between the author and the reader. And most interestingly, it says it's a strategic game between author and reader. And let's think about strategy, Napoleon versus uh, Wellington. Both had a model opponent, but in a way, Echo says Wellington has a better model of Napoleon, and he knew how to play this game. But we don't, um, we don't want to be in this kind of a strategy of fighting. We want to be in a strategy of cooperation. 
And how can we uh, cooperate between programmers? What, how can we build a strategy that helps us uh, share this knowledge? In, we have type declarations, we have documentation, but something really interesting from literary theory is the idea of the paratext. What is a paratext? Echo, quoting Jeanette, this uh, guy from France, Janet says, or echo, the paratext consists of the whole series of messages that accompany and help explain a given text. Messages such as advertisement, jacket copy, title, subtitles, introduction, reviews, and so on. All that uh, makes a paratext that help you understand, um, uh, in this case, a book. But in code, we have documentation, we have package names, we have folder structure, we have pragmas if you don't have skill, we have imports. Uh, for example, in Haskell, you can even have an import that is hiding things from the prelude, so your actual function like plus and minus and whatnot, they mean something completely different. But if you don't read the, the upper text, the paratext on the pragma, you have no idea that your code doesn't mean what it means. Uh, you have compiler flags, you have running mode, test, production, benchmarks. If you have a piece of code that is doing some kind of uh, whatever, calling a database, and what you care is the sorting function that works based on what comes back from the database, What's the meaning of that code in production versus that code in a test run? The database was probably mocked. You're only testing the, the, this part of the code, but then your test blow up. Do you need to go and check the code that out, out, talks to the database or the code that is mocking the database? There, the paratext test on the run is telling you how to understand the code. And Janet says, a paratext is a privileged place of pragmatics and a strategy of an influence on the public, an influence that whether were or poorly understood and achieved, is at the service of a better reception for the text and a more pertinent reading of it. And, and he says, how relevant are paratexts? Paratext, how are you going to read Ulysses by Joyce if you don't know it's called Ulysses? That paratext in the cover is telling you, you maybe have to do a one-to-one -one mapping versus the Ulysses by Homer or the Odyssey and this book. So, and also, even more interesting about the idea of encyclopedia that Umberto Eco says that an encyclopedia is kind of a graph of knowledge interconnected that is changing as we learn new things. Imagine the book when it came out in the 30s in Paris. Nobody wanted to publish it. It was a failure when Ulysses came out until some professor managed to do the one-to-one -one mapping between the Odyssey and Ulysses. Then it was a masterpiece. And after that happens, or try today to read Ulysses without thinking of the Odyssey and Homer, it's impossible because our encyclopedia has been already changed by that piece of knowledge that was dropped in the world. So just that changed the whole uh, interpretation of the book. Or current problem, think how are you going to watch um, House of Cards knowing now that Kevin Spacey raped a person when he was uh, younger or something like that happened. So are you going to just see the same way as before? Maybe not, I don't know. Um, keeping paratext relevant. Like, how to keep comments uh, up to date? This is a, it's really hard because types, definition, they are in a way checked by the compiler, but comments, they, they don't um, stay up to date. Not even Cervantes escaped this fate. Like, Cervantes had an idea for Don Quixote, and then, the editors, they, I think, divided it in four books. So if you read the original in Spanish, the description he gives for chapter 10, you know, like the old books, chapter 10 in which our hero goes and fights somebody and whatever the name, this doesn't match the content of the chapter <laughs> because somebody changed the thing and, yeah, too late. So back to code, because you probably were wondering, is this guy going to talk literature all day or maybe show some code? I did show some code. Think about this class user. You have a username, a password, and a role, constructor, and some getters. Very simple. And that's the test that is telling you, giving you early feedback that this works. So the previous test can tell, give you the feedback that the code works as expected, but still we have no idea about what this is doing from the real world. What, what is that code actually doing? We don't know. But if we add this paratext, package database, we know this code is accessing uh, the database. So probably username and password is how you connect against MySQL, I don't know, and the role could be admin or whatever. 
And if I have model, maybe it's a user from my website that, I don't know, Twitter, how I log into Twitter and what kind of role I have there. So it seems very simple, but just from the text alone, we cannot tell what a program is doing in many times, not always. And we can help ourselves with picking right uh, model na uh, package names, class names, uh, types, um, the folder structure we, we provide to the, to the project we were discussing uh, with Guido earlier, like in Ruby, you have on Ruby on Rails, you have the whole framework telling you this is how we do things. So you know when you find a controller, you know what the, that controller is trying to do. If you are, uh, for example, in Kafka, Kafka has their own scheduler. So if you're in from the Java world and they implemented their own scheduler, you kind of know they have their own way of scheduling threads. I don't know. There are a lot of clues about where I can find things around. And yeah, this, what I already said, like how do you read Ulysses without knowing it's called uh, Ulysses? And how do we build uh, this model reader for, for, for our code? One way is using metaphors. I already gave this talk last year, but I will show some slides just to give some context. There is a book by a researcher from the Netherlands, I think, or Belgium. I don't know. Countries in Europe, they tend to change many times. Um, but they speak the same language sometimes. Anyway, in Europe, you can get paid to do a PhD on the semantics, uh, on the geometry of meaning semantics based on conceptual spaces. Because Europe. In Uruguay, you get paid to check how to keep the meat longer in the fridge, basically. That's the kind of research we do. We have actually an, a research station in Antarctica just to improve the way we put the meat on the fridge, basically. Literally. You can Google that. It's, it's there. Uh, so this person says in that book, metaphorical mappings, like you have metaphors, and metaphors are a mapping from, from, a, from one domain to another. So, a metaphor preserves the cognitive topology of the source domain in a way that is consistent with the inherent structure of the target domain. Metaphors transfer information from one conceptual domain to another. And what is transferred is a pattern, pattern rather than domain-specific information. And a meta metaphor can thus be used to identify a structure in a domain that would not have been seen uh, or discovered other otherwise. So when we understand metaphors, in a way, we are doing this kind of graph isomorphism, but in our brains. And it's very important, because think about microservices. Everybody was doing that somehow, SOA, whatever the name. But when you had microservices, or even now more modern stuff, containers, you have a way to speak, a way to explain, and we are doing that thing. Containers, you can ship stuff. It's packaged. They have a standard. They fit everywhere, whatever. You have a way to talk and speak about this problem. I say scheduling earlier. Could have been a completely different name. But because it's scheduling, you understand the power behind that. In gossip protocols, they, they used to be called uh, gossip. But gossip is it's very easy to understand. I, I, I give a rumor to this person and this other person. This one picks two and keeps spreading information. But it's really hard to reason mathematically. With, when these researchers understood that instead of gossip, they could think about the um, epidemic metaphor, they found there was a whole study of mathematics of how epidemics are spread in a society. So by using that kind of math and this new metaphor, they could reason about uh, gossip algorithms. So, you have the right metaphor, you have the right way of thinking, so think about how we write this down in, in code. There is also a book uh, by Peter Berger, or Berger, depends, and Thomas Lukman, The Social Construction of Reality, a Treatise in the Sociology of Knowledge. These people, they say, we don't argue that the world is there, we don't argue that the world will still be there when I die, but we argue that how we see the world is based on the language we have from our culture. So in the same way, the language we, we use, the abstractions we use, are giving, you, giving us um, a way out into the world. Think about gender. If you have an abstraction that you only have female and male, you are seeing the world in a, in a way. You are, um, th there is a, a saying that says, the map is not the territory. The way you see the map is not actually the, what is there, the tube map on London, for example, it's not geographically correct because you want people to navigate the tube. You don't want them to know ge geography. But 
at the same time, an abstraction is not the territory, a map is not the territory, but then uh, um, a French philosopher says, we live in, a, in an age where the map is making the territory. Because when you say male and female, you are, only, you are telling people you either conform to this or you don't belong. You cannot use my website, you are not part of, of the society, you don't exist. Um, so with language, with abstraction, we are building the territory. When you give a tourist map, you are telling people that monument there is important, this is not so important. So think about how our abstractions affect the, the world outside us. Microservices, I already mentioned this, whatever. Erlang, don't care, don't care. Maps. Tube map, final thing from, for, from the talk. This is a very interesting uh, thing because, as I said already, this doesn't represent geographically correct what is, how is London. And there's a book called, um, or an essay, part of a book called On Beauty by Noah Ilinsky. And he says, like, basically, that design freed the map from any uh, attachment to geography. So here the goal was to teach the person how to use uh, that system, in this case, the tube. So this person says, how are we going to, to create good abstraction, to create this model reader, to share this knowledge encyclopedia? The first area to consider is what knowledge you are trying to convey, what question you are trying to answer, or what story you are trying to tell. The next consideration is how the visualization, in this case he's talking about visualization, is going to be used. The readers and their needs, jargon and biases must all be considered. The reader's specific knowledge need may, needs may not be well understood initially, but this is still a critical factor to bear in mind during the design process. If you cannot eventually express your goal concisely in terms of your readers and their needs, you don't have a target to aim for and have no way to get gauge your success. So our goal is to provide a view of the London subway system that allows riders to easily determine routes between stations. That's the goal that gives us that other map. Think the same way in the way you do abstractions. So understanding the goals of the visualization will allow you to effectively select which facets of the data to include and which are not useful or worse, distracting. No time for that. There's another book, final thing, Data and Reality, a Timeless Perspective on Perceiving and Managing Information in Our Imprecise World. This book is from the 70s. Breathe, talk. That's what they, they tell me usually. And this person said, William Kent, that after a while he was doing all this data mapping and whatnot, and said, after a while it dawned on me that these are all just maps, being poor artificial approximations of some real underlying terrain. He says, the map is not the territory. What is the territory really like? How can I describe it to you? Any description I give you is just another map. All our abstraction will be just this kind of maps. And finally, you have this code, a person, name and age, user, whatever, getters. Imagine you have that comment there. This is not a person. <laughs> you probably know what the joke is about, Magritte, right? And you say, yeah, cool, bro, but do you want to be like a philosopher? No. How many times have you argued that this, why is the user doing that? The user in the website shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, because the user in your model is not the user in the real life. The file system implementation for your particular operating system is not the actual underlying file system. And we, because we are not used to think, to think in semiotic terms, we are not used to make this distinction of like, this abstraction in my code is actually not whatever there is uh, in the real world. And sometimes we go so deep into trying to solve a bug because we don't realize that, yeah, maybe the bug report we have is just to remove that gender field and you are done with the problem. Thank you. References, 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 references. And yeah, that's all. Thank you. So does anyone have any questions? We have time for one, I think. Do you, do you have an idea on how a, a team can deal with naming variables and functions? For example, can you re reject a pull request due to poor variable naming? So speaking of dictionaries, in the last century, we moved from prescription to description. 
I don't like to give prescription. I think this is being recorded and somebody say, Alvaro, say that you have to do this or that. Reject pull requests and don't reject, whatever. I think it's something that the team must agree on. For example, if you are fighting about uh, tabs, where the semicolon is, just create a code standard and argue with that. If, can we argue about the name? Is the name explanatory enough or not? Is, it, is, is this the right metaphor? It isn't, I don't know, but this is something that your team needs to agree. But I think to let somebody reach the point of sending a pull request and the problem is the name of a variable, I think there is a problem in the process that this didn't surface early, earlier. Like, they, they don't talk to each other when there's a, a scrum meeting in the morning, I don't know, whatever the process the company is, is using. Like, I'm, I'm creating this um, Guri class. Guri is a word from Guarani, Latin American language, which means little kid. You see, nobody understands what a Guri is. I really understand that you like your culture, but maybe use child. I don't know. You know, like... If, if this doesn't come up in the usual discussion between people, like uh, an author, they publish a book, it's out there, then a train comes, kill the author, who knows what they brought, you cannot go and talk to them. That's my point. Uh, programmers, we are one Slack message away. So we can build together the encyclopedia, we can together decide what are our standards. That's my point, basically. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Albert, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks. We will have a small pause before the other talk begins.